Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Gingrich Hebert, and I have the privilege of serving as director of the Toronto Mennonite Theological Center. On behalf of the planning committee for this conference, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the keynote lecture, part of our ninth biennial graduate student conference on the theme of hope, despair, lament. For those of you just briefly that may not be familiar with TMTC, we are a graduate teaching and research center of Conrad Grable University College affiliated with the Toronto School of Theology and supported by a number of Mennonite academic institutions, including Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, Canadian Mennonite University, and Eastern Mennonite University and Seminary, as well as denominational bodies, including the Toronto United Mennonite Church, Mennonite Church Eastern Canada, and Mennonite Church Canada. Our biennial graduate student conference began in 2002, and they are a unique and interdisciplinary opportunity for Mennonites and other graduate students studying at institutions scattered across North America and beyond to gather and share their academic research with each other. As many past participants can attest, they're also a place where long lasting and meaningful friendships are forged. And though we are disappointed not to be able to be gathered together at EMU tonight, we're very grateful indeed that our keynote lecturer this evening, Dr. David Evans, has graciously stuck with us through, during our year long postponement and is here with us this evening. Before I turn proceedings over to my fellow planning committee member, Ben Bixler, who will preside over proceedings this evening, I want to acknowledge the sacred land on which the Toronto Mennonite Theological Center operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. As part of Conrad Grable University College, TMTC is also privileged to operate on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River, that is the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. I also want to acknowledge that our lecturer this evening is joining us from Harrisonburg, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, which is the traditional territory of the Siouan, Algonquin, and Haudenosaunee peoples and that many others are joining us from across Turtle Island and beyond. So with that, I will turn proceedings over to, to Ben, who will guide us through how we'll proceed this evening. To you, Ben. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, I wanna begin with just a few quick logistical notes for tonight, um, and then I'll introduce David and then turn, turn the uh, time over to him. Um, so first of all, the main session is being recorded, um, but we will not be recording the question and answer time that follows. Just wanted to make you aware so that you knew um, what was being recorded and what wasn't. Um, secondly, if you would please turn or leave on your videos as you are able. Uh, we are attempting to replicate a small part of an in-person conference, and we feel that this helps to facilitate some of the connection that has made this uh, conference so meaningful in the past. So if you're able, please leave your video on. It helps us, um, helps our presenter get some feedback to see faces and it helps us to see each other as well. Uh, lastly, you can feel free to post questions at any point to me in the chat and I can hold them for the end uh, when we do question and answer time, or you can simply wait with your questions um, to either put them in the chat or uh, raise your hand and ask them uh, verbally at the end of the presentation when we move to that question and answer time. Um, so we are delighted to have Dr. David Evans as our keynote speaker tonight. Dr. Evans is Associate Professor of History and Intercultural Studies and the Director of Cross-Cultural Programs at Eastern Mennonite Seminary, where he has been teaching since 2012. He earned a PhD from Drew University and completed his MTS degree at Wesley Theological Seminary. His work seeks to examine how race, religion, and nation intersect in America. His current project investigates the practices of white Christian agrarian pacifist resistance to Jim Crowism in the context of black freedom activism. His interest in religion and ecology leads to his practice of a local ecolutionary lifestyle that connects with his teaching and scholarship. Dr. Evans has also worked in various ministry contexts, while living in Washington, D.C., he was the junior senior high director of an out-of-school time program on Capitol Hill. Later, he served as community development resource coordinator with MCC East Coast. He was also co-pastor of Booton United Methodist Church in New Jersey. Dr. Evans's publications include a co-edited volume titled Between the World of ta Coates and Christianity, 
as well as numerous articles in edited collections and journals such as Christianity Today, the Journal of Religious History, Methodist History, and the online publication Bearings. On a personal note, Dr. Evans was a formative professor for me in my master's degree when he was a reader for my thesis, and then guided me to my current PhD program at Drew University. His course, Christianity Through the Eyes of American Outsiders, was my first academic encounter with race and gave me new lenses to understand race in America. We've also been in the same fantasy basketball league for the past few years, although we won't talk tonight about how either of us finished this year. On behalf of the planning committee, I want to thank you for being with us tonight, and we look forward to your lecture entitled American History Never Was American to Me. Thank you so much, Ben. Let me make sure that I'm not muted. I have a tendency to just keep going and y'all can hear me so great. Um, I really wanna thank you all for inviting me to participate, um, Kyle and the rest of the planning committee. Um, ben, it's really good to see you. I'm looking forward to calling you doctor at some point soon, I hope. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to sharing with you all and hearing uh, you know, your interactions and uh, engagement with some of what I've been thinking about for the last two years. It's interesting to think about the fact that uh, this invitation uh, was extended uh, quite some time ago. And uh, when it was extended again, in some ways I was in a different place. Um, but the title of what I was planning to do last year actually coincided with a lot of what I was thinking about uh, even now still. So uh, without further ado, um, I should say a little bit about more about myself. As, as Ben mentioned, I'm an associate professor of history and intercultural studies. I identify squarely as a historian of US religion. Uh, I study whiteness. That's usually where I tend to go with my studies. Um, but I identify mostly as a historian. I engage things from a historical lens. I, I'm very fascinated and geek out about historiographical issues. And this evening, I want to make an announcement. I want to make an announcement that most of my colleagues will deny. Despite the what the rest of my historical guild will tell you, history has a problem. History is not objective or unbiased. As many of you know, it is deeply political. As I'm sure even those of you who didn't know before have been made aware when you've heard politicians over the past 20 years refer to so-called revisionist histories, and as you hear controversies in the United States over the 1619 Project today. Still, neither bias nor politics is the problem from my perspective. Moreover, this problem, though I'll contextualize it within my discipline, is not unique to history, nor did the discipline of history invent this problem. The problem is one of oppressive power, and it permeates the academy. It is a problem that has emerged from the Western Enlightenment and gave rise to the concept of white supremacy and the making of the white race. Those of us who study the whiteness project in the context of the United States of America identify it as a racial project that aspires to imperialist and patriarchal ends. This past year, my colleagues at Eastern Mennonite Seminary and I read After Whiteness, a book in which Willie Jennings names these aspirations as mastery, possession, and control. You may be familiar with Cornel West, who uh, often argues that white modernists terrorized, stigmatized, and traumatized those they colonized. Tanahasi Coates summarizes this idea in another way by stating that the whiteness project is synonymous with the plunder of black bodies, amongst other bodies. Others have noted that those who invested in and orchestrated the whiteness project held exclusionary, expansionist, and even genocidal goals. When I speak of whiteness this, ev this evening, I wanna draw your attention to, and I am speaking of its possessive, exclusionary, and patriarchal modes of academic production. When motivated by the goal to sustain or expand white possession, authority, and force, I have observed that white societies construct systems and institutions to denigrate, control, or even destroy those people deemed unassimilable or undesirable. 
and they have used academia as the intellectual tool to justify those imperialistic endeavors. Now, before I go any further, I wanna name how problematic my, our use of American is in the, in the guild of American history. I wanna name that the centering of US interests in power um, is a big part of the use of it. And that's exactly what it's doing. Excluding the Americans prior to our presence here and the Americans that cover the South and North American continents in favor of a white heteropatriarchal capitalist imperialism. So I don't want us to forget that. Every time I name American, I want you to hear that because I am bound in some ways by that language by being a part of the guild I'm in. In the American Historical Guild, imperialistic endeavors look like, and not solely, uh, uh, American history textbooks omitting things like white terrorism. Kids these days have to learn about white terrorism on the soil of the United States of America by watching sci-fi movies on HBO and learning about places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, not in their classrooms. And history courses championing the stories of great white men who fought noble battles, shaped nations, or invented fields of inquiry while ignoring their participation in theft enslavement and genocide of people and their cultures. It also looks like only discussing the indigenous, enslaved, marginalized, minoritized, black and brown people in cultural segments that seem insignificant to the main storyline. Oh, let's look at Black History Month or we'll have a Latino poetry festival here or there. But they neglect to take these same folks seriously as theorists or founders of disciplines. For example, instead of learning W.E.B. Du Bois, Zora Neale Hurston, Franz Fanon, Ralph Ellison, Ella Baker, Martin Luther King Jr., Booker T. Watley, Fannie Lou Hamer, James Baldwin, Alice Walker, or Toni Morrison as founders of sociology, anthropology, community shared agriculture, interpreters of Western history or literary critics, we may learn to view them only as spectacles in the story of American history. In other words, as the first black graduate of Harvard, a black author of an American novel in African-American vernacular English, or look, a, a black war therapist or a black civil rights organizer, a black author of the great American novel, a black farmer, a great black writer. In the congratulatory narrative of American history, these figures serve as exemplars of the possibility of success that is available to black people if they work hard enough to overcome great obstacles, which we're reminded is possible, even if we only have a few examples. These exemplars become historical actors in our academic fields who exist for the white gaze. Actors, some outside of black studies will acknowledge but rarely for more than a kind of passing amusement. Franz Fanon, the West Indian psychoanalyst, described this phenomenon as he dramatized a host of white onlookers who fetishized him with their gaze. Look, a Negro. It was a passing sting. I, I attempted a smile. Look, a Negro. Absolutely. I was beginning to enjoy myself. Look, a Negro. The circle was getting smaller. I was really enjoying myself. Maman, look, a Negro, I'm scared. Scared? Scared? Now they're beginning to be scared of me? I wanted to kill myself laughing, but laughter had become out of the question. Those of us born and raised in colonized lands know this gaze well. Look, a Negro who can read. Look, a Negro who can write. Look, a Negro who can farm. Look, a Negro who can speak. Look, a Negro who can read, write, farm, and speak. How frightening. The white guy gaze cares not what we read, what we write, what we grow, nor what we say, but it does care to control us. We are in the context of the academy possessed, patronized, tokenized. Even in our emerging disciplines, we are sidelined as black church, black preaching, black literature, black history, African-American or black studies. And the issue here isn't with black studies, 
It's with the treatment of black studies by other disciplines that we simply refer to as history, preaching, or literature as though they, in the absence of any racial or ethnic marker, bear the authority of normativity, when in fact they are only normative in that their whiteness has been rendered invisible by being defined as the normative state of existence. Black studies is frightening because it is a powerful and necessary project that must be pursued and promoted for the very reason that it makes the whiteness of the academy visible by calling our attention to blackness. And the point that Cornell West makes is thereby heightening our awareness of whiteness. Black studies is not an alternative story or history. What I'm saying here is that Black history is American history in the same way that Indigenous history, women's history, queer history is American history, not merely part of the history. As we are seeing with the emergence of the 1619 Project, it is the history. And if you had any curiosity about how powerful or important or frightening perhaps that history is to the whiteness project look no further than politicians who are trying to outlaw the use of it in high school classrooms. In this same vein, Black Lives Matter activism, Black student associations on college campuses, anti-racism education and corporate headquarters, Black leadership and political campaigns are challenging white establishments to revolutionize the structures of their institutions to reflect their indebtedness to black and brown labor and humanity. These narratives are necessary for the accurate and transformative telling of our human story. Without such a telling, what we have is a white academy, a white history, not an American one. That is to say, American history, to riff upon a bar by Langston Hughes, never was American to me. As long as it denies the necessity of indigenous black labor and women's presence, the only thing American about the history is in its consistent consumption and exclusion of human bodies that white society deems unassimilable or undesirable. In order for American history to become truly American, the white gaze must be reversed so that the original dwellers of the land, those who farmed the land, those who built the roads, the buildings, the infrastructure, and gave cultural expression to the land might provide us a more comprehensive narrative of what the whiteness project needed to possess, exclude, and paternalize in order to justify its existence. You see, it had to be justified because as much as the plunderers wanted to propagandize the concept that this was always a white country, James Baldwin was right when he rebuked them in saying, no one was white before he or she came to America. It took generations and a vast amount of coercion before this became a white country. This evening, I'm inviting you to consider with me the ways that American history and by proxy, all of the disciplines serve the interests of whiteness, possession, exclusion, and patriarchy. For as long as this is the case, whiteness will have a proverbial chokehold on history, exclude those that challenge its claim to divide and right and sustain the rule of the pale faces. American history will never be American as long as the Americans who first live here, the Americans who built the, this place and the Americans whose bodies, cultures and communities were plundered for the sake of its dream do not provide the interpretations of what happened here. Chinua Achebe was right. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. As students of the disciplines, proverbial hunters and lions, if you will, I'm inviting us to consider our role in the writing of the stories we will live our lives by. As a scholar of religion, I believe there's nothing more important to culture and the culture of the academy than the stories we tell. In religion speak, we might refer to these stories as myths, tales that order our lives and provide us with meaning and guidance. These myths may or may not be scientifically provable, but of course, that's not the point. The point is that it is with and upon these stories that we justify our actions in the world. For me, there are important questions to ask of these myths. 
Who are they for? Who benefits from them? Who is harmed by them? Who is responsible for them? And can those people be trusted with them any longer? Who can be trusted to make myths that will liberate and empower? And what is our role in promoting those myths? Y'all, the lions only have one role to play in the story of the hunt, and that is to be hunted. And as, they, as long as they live in the trauma of the chase or worse, die by the gun of the hunter, they can't tell their story. So who will? That is to put the question on us. Whose story will we tell? Whose story will I tell? Whose story will you tell? And whose interests will we serve? The hunters or the lions? To answer these questions, I believe we must do more than engage in intellectual exercises and abstract speculations. We must find ourselves in the narratives. We must unmask ourselves from the white academic facades that our programs have trained us to hide behind. If our disciplines can convince us that our professional position should be to stand outside of our research and objectively engage our projects as though there's nothing at stake, then we will maintain the status quo. In my field, this means willingly transgressing the great sin of presentism. That is interrogating the past with present concerns. Because from my perspective, what's unsaid from this historical orthodox position is that, is that those who insist most upon avoiding such transgressions of presentism have always approached their research with present concerns, masked as quests for objective truth. This in part explains why people like Sarah Bond, who wanted to make sure that her students could see themselves in the ancient history she taught, received death threats for teaching that ancient Roman statues were once painted with colors that reflected the diversity of the Mediterranean world. Because for too long, many of us who teach antiquity studies and medieval studies have allowed people to assume that Roman statues were always white, presumably like the people who originally viewed them. Now, I'm not saying that we must find new ways to fabricate the past, to pit one set of lies against another set of lies. What I'm saying is that until we find who the lions are in our disciplines and discern the extent to which we are hunters or lions, the history will be of the hunt and glorify the hunter. It took me many years to learn that I was a lion. Raised in Lansing, Michigan, living in the unstable line of poverty and the middle class for most of my life, my mother wanted to give us much of the trappings of the middle class experience as possible. And that involved chasing a home or purchasing a home on a street where we would become the first black family. It involved integrating a white neighborhood in a Northern US city, which I tell you, in 1986, this is not really comparable to integrating a Southern white neighborhood in the 1970s, but it presented its own set of challenges. It was here that I learned that racism was not always accompanied by racist language or overt exclusionary acts. Oftentimes it was unnamed and invisible. I'm sure I heard the N word on more than one occasion. The neighborhood white kids referred to my older brother as an ape and I confronted them with my hands on many occasions. I wasn't baptized in the Anabaptist fires uh, at that point. Still most of the time, we played football and basketball together and learned to play together while steering away from explicit conversations about race. Playing sometimes led to friendship. My best friend, for example, was a white kid who I still have fond memories of. But friendship with white girls was different because sometimes that friendship turned into crushes on white girls. It was here that I learned the lessons white parents taught their white children in the privacy of their homes, not because I was in their homes, but because as one of my friends on the street told me, one of the white girls explained to me, my father said he would disown me if I ever dated a black man. Her father was the janitor at one of the local high schools. And he always, whenever he would see me, I played basketball for a rival team across town. And whenever he would see me at his school, he would express how proud of me he was when I would show up and I, even if I didn't do much, 
He was just so happy and proud that I was there and told me I was doing a great job. But I always heard his daughter's words behind his expressions of pride. And it taught me that what white people said about racism wasn't too true. Racism wasn't always obvious. Most of the time you needed to learn to hear the words unspoken because what you didn't hear or didn't know could hurt you or someone you care about. The social les lessons I learned on my street were crucial to my survival in K through 12 education. Being part of the first black family to move onto Roberts Lane also meant that we were one of few black families that attended the local elementary school. By my count, there were only two black kids in my fourth and fifth grade classes. What I learned on my street was that the white people believed that they were superior to black people, no matter their class or gender. In school, I learned that I needed to outperform my white classmates at every task in order to gain a similar level of respect. And I felt like I was on my own. So I became the best athlete despite my size and the most gifted and talented student despite my race. Unknowingly, I was reliving the educational experience of many black boys who like W.E.B. Du Bois felt that the sky was bluest when I could beat my mates at examination time or beat them at a foot race or even beat their stringy heads. My fierce rage notwithstanding, I was a mostly compliant nerdy kid who aimed to please my family and teachers. I sailed through the academic requirements of school. But here's, here's one of the funny things about my, my schooling. I hated history. Like many people, even some of you out, out here right now in this, in this Zoom room, you hate history. I get students every year who come to me and say, David, I hate history. Why do we have to do this, right? I hated the names, the dates, events. I get it. I hated memorizing the story of the stories of old white guys who are pure hearted and noble minded. Now, don't make any mistake. I had no critique of any of these ideas. They just bored me. I found them entirely uninteresting. And even when my mother purchased a set of black encyclopedias and insisted that we learn about black inventors and artists, I remained disinterested. I felt entirely disconnected from those historical figures, despite the fact that we shared an American experience. I didn't know about Du Bois. I didn't know that Malcolm X grew up in my town. I didn't know that the things that I was going through were things that other people had gone through as well. History belonged to the teachers, the textbooks, and it had nothing to offer me on the street and in my city where I struggled to assert my presence in the world. At least that's how I felt. It wasn't until I read W.B. Du Bois in my junior year of undergrad that I connected with the words from a historical text, text The Souls of Black Folk. And mind you, this was not in a class. I checked the book out from the library because I had seen an excerpt in one of my psychology books. The psychology book didn't expound upon Du Bois. It just offered this little uh, paragraph. And I was compelled to go to the library and check out this book. And I quote, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. Du Bois was singing my life with his words the weight of which pressed me to the floor of my college apartment. Y'all, I had never had an experience like that before where I'm reading a book and I was thrown to the floor weeping in tears. I was pressed down by the weight of a century of history. I was undone by the feeling that another black man could feel precisely what I felt almost a century before the moment I read his words. I had the existential awareness that I was trapped in a history that only then was I beginning to understand. The Souls of Blackfoot was, wasn't simply a text written by a black man. It was an analysis of the social and historical structures of an America that my history books failed to describe because they weren't written for me. The so-called objective histories were written from a white gaze and for a white gaze. The white gaze became the lens through which I was taught to see my entire world. 
And though it taught me to see what Lillian Smith explained, that even in the North, it was possible to segregate without signs by the other side of the tracks, with potholes in the road, through dilapidated buildings, by the presence of police cars patrolling the neighborhood. I couldn't see that the other side, the potholes, the buildings and patrols told a truth about America that the white gaze attempted to suppress through broken window policing and racial profiling. And that truth was, as Baldwin has said, that the details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. After I read James Baldwin and Toni Morrison in grad school, I began to see a pattern. Like Du Bois, Baldwin and Morrison were offering more than imaginative stories about the black experience or eloquent essays, which of course, they were offering those as well. Baldwin was also telling us something about the fiction that is American history, that it was very consistent with white America's lies about noble beginnings of the American project and its need to keep black people in a fixed place in the white sacred cosmos, never to be moved or liberated from that place. And Morrison was beseeching all of us to reconsider what we identify as American classic literature because classic American education did not tell the truth about life. And to the extent it did, it testified to the flat, placid, tasteless, stoic qualities of whiteness. The American Africanist characters in these classic American novels that existed to add texture, passion, flavor, and emotion to white fantasies would have never survived reality. Real black people had to be experts and know way more about whiteness in order to survive the white world that infringed upon their humanity than these characters in these books. And this is why any attempt to describe the American experience accurately must emerge from the gaze of those people most harmed by whiteness, because they know more about white society than white society knows about itself. I, I, I love when I do that part. I, I just have to pause for a second, because the whole point for me of whiteness studies is to provoke white society to do its own work. I want to poke and provo provoke, uh, provoke and prod you and white society until they say, hey, look, you're not going to tell me who I am, right? As a social historian, Black interpretive lenses match well with interpreting history from the perspective of those with the most limited power to make decisions that affect their lives or the lives of others. And that is what I aim to do in my current project, Damned Whiteness, to recontextualize the histories of three white radical Christian pacifists in the era of black freedom movements. This is what I call reversing the gaze. Now much has been written about the white gaze through which W.E.B. Du Bois constructed, instructed even black people must look through in order to survive in a society that caters to the whims of white people past and present. Damned Whiteness is my attempt to look differently to reverse the gaze, to consider what interpretations and histories we might see if we assume that those most directly affected by racial, religious, national, and gender oppression have the most comprehensive view of it. By looking at the racial activism of self-proclaimed white peacemakers from the context of the Black Freedom Era, I hope to demonstrate that their practice of exclusively white leadership focus on fellowship over freedom and commitments to models of white charity to blacks instead of solidarity with them hindered their visions to create communities that practiced racial equality. A less visible but consistent argument I hope to make is that histories that celebrate white peacemakers for agreeing with the goals of black freedom movements but who disagree with the methods of black freedom fighters exaggerate the importance of these white peacemakers in the march for freedom and justice. Such histories teach those who consume them to value intentions of white racial actions over their impact, to value charity to racially oppressed people over solidarity with them, and to underestimate the role that racial position plays in the practices of white Christian radicals. You see, I argue that reversing the gaze has enabled me to see the history of white peacemaking more clearly. Now, many, some of you, you're historians, you've read a lot of texts, you know, this isn't entirely new. I'm not the first person to attempt to do something like this in my field. 
I think especially of Daniel Richter's facing East from Indian country, which certainly aims to change our perspective on colonial America. Richter's effort to reorient Americanists from a Eurocentric view to a native centered view has inspired me at times. However, where Richter engages native primary sources to examine their views of Christianity, even those sources are redacted through European lenses, which makes it very difficult. In my work, I use black primary sources that their authors actually intended to be read as interpretive sources. And I rely heavily on people like Ralph Ellison, who in his novel, Invisible Man, uh, is, is writing as more than just a great American novel. It's clear that Ellison intends his Invisible Man, who has no name, to be a proxy for a black voice, presence and perspective that interprets American history as a terrorizing experience for black communities. And it is through this interpretive framework that Ellison beseeches his readers to see differently and to learn that this history from the lower frequencies, er, um, from the lower frequencies is the key to black freedom and perhaps freedom for us all. Now, I think that the history of black freedom movements presents opportunities for us to reverse our perspective on race relations, racial justice, and peace building. From what I see, too much of what has been celebrated in the long era of black freedom has focused our attention on movements that white people find agreeable with their pace for progress rather than what black people find necessary to promote their own freedom. That may be in part because to focus on the latter rather than the former would draw attention to black freedom fighters critiques of white folks. And until rather recently, black criticisms of white people did not interest predominantly white audiences. But if we reverse the gaze, these critiques become normative. So finally, while my primary interest for this project is historically minded, I do believe that there are implications for my reversing the gaze approach for many of our disciplines. I've already found that this approach has continuities with black liberation theology and black scholars of restorative justice, who from my perspective and subsequent application to historical inquiry suggest that the most directly, that those most directly affected by injustice and oppression should be the ones who have the most authority in defining what justice and freedom entail. Applying these ideas to my project has had great implications considering that not only were black and brown people most directly affected by racial oppression, black freedom movements were most responsible for developing methods for resisting it and drawing awareness to racial freedom and justice. I assume that similar, similar benefits would emerge from applying black theology and black restorative justice methods to other disciplines in the humanities. In Black Theology and Black Power by James Cone, he argues that since only blacks know the extent of white oppression, only blacks are prepared to risk all to be free. The terms and methods that lead to freedom from this black power perspective proclaim that if blacks are liberated, it will be blacks themselves who do the liberating, not whites. As I see it, stories of those working for freedom from racial oppression might best be narrated and analyzed by those who best understand it which means privileging the perspectives of black theorists, be they novelists, psychoanalysts, poets, essayists, or historians. Similarly, the history of black freedom movements provides evidence for what Fania Davis recommends in the little book on race and restorative justice. Quote, that those directly impacted by an offense should have decision-making powers about their lives. Decisions should be made at the lowest levels rather than by a central authority. She further clarifies that this justice practice should center marginalized voices, elevate counter narratives and unveil truths that have been historically silenced. And that's precisely what reversing the gaze would do. So I wanna conclude by offering an invitation. Early in this presentation, I asked a series of questions that I'd like us to consider as we engage our writing projects, presentations and classroom assignments. Who are they for? Who benefits from them? Who is harmed by them? Who is responsible for them? Can those people be trusted with them any longer? Who can be trusted to make myths that will liberate and empower? What is our role in promoting those myths? In other words, Whose stories will you tell? 
and maybe more importantly, whose interests will you serve? From my perspective, the academy tempts us to write for other academics, to make presentations for self-promotion, and even to ignore the craft of teaching in our classrooms. If, however, we reverse our gaze from the objects of oppression to the subjects of the oppression, making whiteness visible by engaging with communities that have been oppressed and minoritized, then we may in fact resist the temptation to serve the whiteness project and instead create projects that restore and liberate. Y'all, I'm not interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake or history for history's sake. To be honest with you, I don't even understand what that means outside of the ivory towers of academia. I'm interested in, Amer in an American history that liberates and empowers communities who live under the weight of white oppression. Anything else in my view would be un-American. Thank you. <laughs>